Grace to you and peace from God our Creator, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, bless now the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts. Breathe your Spirit into us and grant that we may hear and in hearing be led in the way you want us to go. Amen. Amen. Okay, got some trivia questions for you. Let's see what you can identify. Stacks of wax. Records. Records. Yeah, I'm going to give you another clue and say vinyls. <coughs> Stacks of records. Anybody remember listening to records? 78s? Those the little ones, you know, with the Davy Crockett song or something like that. The 45s, where sometimes you had to have a little adapter on your turntable so they would fit. And then the LPs, <laughs> the long play albums. Well, we sure have advanced a long way from then. Now, if I want to listen to a song, I can download it off the internet and load it onto my phone, or I can use any number of music streaming applications on the phone so that I can listen to whatever style of music I want. Yesterday I was listening to patriotic country songs. That amazes me that we can do that that we can put music into our phones and listen to them. Because I listen to music every night when I'm going to sleep. And when I'm working, it helps me to focus and get my work done. If you would ask me a year ago, would I be listening to music on my phone or playing it for us in church? I'd have said, no way. This is a marvelous little gadget. Well, it's got gadgets, but it is a gadget. And up here in the right-hand corner is the number 100. That's the strength of the battery. See, as marvelous as this thing is, if I don't plug it into a power source on a regular basis, the power is going to drain, and eventually, the phone's going to die. The same is true for my battery-powered watch and my battery-powered brain. <laughs> I have to plug them in every now and then to recharge them. Young Bonnie, you were talking about how this is your first week off from work in quite some time. I know this is an opportunity for you to dial it down and to recharge before you go back to take care of those lovely animals. God intended for us to do great and marvelous things. In fact, Jesus himself said, you will do even greater things than I do. So what changed a group of frightened, timid, provincial men and women into world-traveled evangelists and missionaries? was God's Holy Spirit. It's God's Spirit that enables us to share good news with other people. Because let's face it, we live in a very diverse, no, divisive and fractured society. And that can cause all kinds of problems and conflicts within families, within homes, within communities, within our country. You see, good people are supposed to do good things, not bad things. You bring people together, and we see that senseless violence begets senseless violence. Republicans attack Democrats, who in turn attack Republicans. We're seeing it in the news with the whole budget crisis. Each side has their position, and God forbid they come together and compromise. That would be disloyal to the people who elected them. 
or at least that's their answer. When in reality, they just want to be the one who calls the shots. And they don't want to cede anything to the other party. Red states, blue states, black lives matter, white power, say his name. Each week brings more incidences of shootings in public and shootings in private. While Congress debates how many angels can dance on the firing pin of an AR-15. <laughs> Enough. Enough. Martin Luther King once said, it is no longer a choice, my friends, between violence and nonviolence. It is either nonviolence or non-existence. Makes me wonder, how do we convey the good news of Christ in such a fractured and divisive environment? The answer can be found in peanuts. <laughs> no, not, not the kind that comes with the Cracker Jacks. Charles Schultz's cartoon strip, which taught me more about life growing up than just about anything else. And in this one particular cartoon, Charlie Brown, he with the pumpkin head, is lying on the ground with his head on a rock, and he says to Lucy Van Pelt, his tormentor, who never let him kick the football, Lucy, I have something to tell you, but I don't want you to laugh. She said, I won't. This is very personal. Please promise, ye, promise me that you will not laugh. I promise. Lucy, sometimes at night when I'm lying in my bed, I can almost hear a voice in the distance that says, we love you, Charlie Brown. And the next panel shows Lucy, ha 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 ha, and the force of her laughter blows Charlie away. There are people all in this world who are desperate to hear the message that they are loved, that they are valued, that they are important. And we are to be that voice. We can tell other people we love them and that God loves them till we're blue in the face. But unless our actions mirror our words, they're still going to be craving what they need most. I remember growing up watching the Billy Graham Crusades. Anybody else remember those? Where you filled entire stadiums and always sang just as I am when people came to the altar. I remember one of his slogans was winning the world for Christ. Okay, we don't have too many evangelists like Billy Graham anymore, but that's okay. Because we can win the world for Christ by doing what Jesus said in Matthew 13. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. So many times as I've led the congregation in worship on Pentecost Sunday, I've prayed, Lord, send your spirit again as you did that first Pentecost Sunday. Inspire us so that when we leave this room, we go out into our community proclaiming the living and triumphant good news of Jesus Christ. I keep waiting for that sound of a mighty rushing wind to come through here. And we've had it on occasion, but it's only the Santa Annas. <laughs> and that's not quite the same thing. The typical church congregation is comprised of people with a consumer mentality. A new restaurant just opened near our home. 
and there are large crowds. Part of people like the new, part of us, we don't have a whole lot of options in Sun City. But if the service there is no good, if the food is not of high quality, those crowds are going to thin out. Because if I can't get my needs met here, then I will go there. And there are people who have the same attitude toward church. People are content to sit in their pew, in their assigned seat. My mother was always third pew from the front, right hand side. Bonnie, she'd be sitting right in front of you. <laughs> and if she came to church and Carolyn was sitting there, well, she'd move to the fourth pew, but she'd harumph throughout the entire service. It's just, it just doesn't feel like church. Because I'm not in my own seat. I kept telling her, Ma, this isn't New England. You didn't pay for the pew. You want to have your own pew? Buy it. And have your name put on it. But we come to church, we sit in our seats, but maybe the pastor says something we don't like. Or maybe he picks a hymn that's hard to sing. And suddenly the worship service is ruined for us like it was for my mother when she couldn't get into the third view from the front on the right hand side. Because we're missing the point. We're not here for what we can get. You're here for what you can give. It's called worship for a reason. It comes from the old English word worship. We worship because God is worthy of our worship. <coughs> this is Memorial Day weekend. And I've been very proud to serve my country as a chaplain in the United States Navy. In that capacity, I've known many sailors and Marines who were proud to wear their dress uniform and proud to call themselves servicemen until you asked them to do something. Mm -hmm. And then they griped and complained and required that the sergeant would explain to them why they need to be digging a ditch. When a lot of the Marine sergeants that I knew and chief petty officers were just like my mom, who would respond and say those dreaded words, because I said so. <laughs> I've had troops come to me and tell me, Chaplain, I enlisted to get the educational benefits. Nobody said anything to me about having to go overseas or having to go out into the desert for three weeks. Anybody remember the many loves of Dobie Gillis? Okay, this is Bob Denver before he was Gillian. He played a beatnik character called Maynard G. Krebs. And whenever the opportunity was presented to him to be gainfully employed, his answer was, work? You want me to work? <laughs> this weekend is not about picnics. This weekend is not about going to the beach or to the lake or having some family backyard barbecue. It's about honoring the sacrifice of those men and women who picked up their torch, just like it says in the Flanders Field poem, and like Lady Liberty, waving a beacon of welcome and freedom, just as the cross is a symbol of welcome and freedom for Christians. Now, one of the other highlights of this weekend, and by the way, Bob Borsma says hello. <laughs> Hi, Bob. If you remember Bob, he was a passionate NASCAR fan. And I know he's going to, he yelled at me yesterday on the phone when I talked about this being the weekend for the Indianapolis 500. And he had to explain to me the difference between NASCAR and <laughs> open wheel race cars. 
but doesn't say New York Yankee, I'm not interested. But in a race, especially as long as the one that they're hosting today, 500 miles. At various points during the race, the drivers will pull into a particular area of the track called the pits. And that's where they go to refuel their cars, to change the tires, to perform minor repairs, and to give the driver some kind of nourishment. I've seen a bunch of these races. And there's always discussion as we get closer to the end about who's going to take that last pit stop and charge the finish line or who's going to pass up on that and see if they can make it all the way to the checkered flag. And there have been several times I've watched where somebody chose to pass up going into the pits and ran out of gas before they got to the finish line. Folks, if you're not taking time for worship each week, if you're forgetting that the commandment says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, then come Wednesday or Thursday, depending on the difficulty of the challenges in your life, you may run out of gas. It's tempting to think that life is overwhelming, that life is more than I can handle. I've got problems in my family, I've got too many bills, there's conflict out in town, the price of gas, the price of this. And then you pray, Lord, where are you? And he said, well, I'm right here with you. But I was wondering the same thing about you last Sunday. How come you weren't in my house? You know, sadly for some of our people, they run out of gas before they make it to the finish line. My brothers and sisters, this is our pit stop. We come here to worship God and to sing praises to his name. We come to refuel our souls. We come to be nourished at the Lord's table and inspired by God's word. Yeah, there are others with different priorities, and they've chosen to be elsewhere this morning. I always joke and say a lot of our Christians come to church disguised as empty spaces in the pews. Mm. That's their decision. And I can't tell anybody what to make important or what to do with their lives. But at our recent Synod Assembly, one of the themes that I heard presented repeatedly was how we as a church, the ELCA, by the way, 96% white as a denomination. 96% white within our own synod. And that includes congregations near the Mexican border and in the Hawaiian Islands. But I heard a lot of conversation from different congregations about how they're struggling, numbers are small, they don't know if they're going to be able to survive or not. And certainly, we fall into that category. We were commenting before about how the numbers here have gotten so cozy over the years. When we talk about evangelism, I mentioned to one person about sharing the news with other people. You know, Harvest Church, and nothing else about them, they close their worship services by telling everybody, come back next Sunday and bring an unsaved friend. I mentioned that here one Sunday, and a member of the congregation said to me, well, pastor, everyone I know belongs to a church. Everyone you know. What about the people you don't know yet? And after all, a stranger is just a friend you haven't met yet. Do you think it's possible you could share the gospel with somebody in the supermarket? Or at the pump next to you? at the gas station? No, I'm not saying buttonhole them and hold their head under water until they become a Christian. 
I'm just saying there are opportunities that will present themselves for you to share your faith. I remember someone else saying to me, well, Pastor, our doors are always open on Sunday morning. Anytime they want to come in, we'll welcome them. And my answer to him was, well, how many people have you personally invited to walk through that door this morning? He got kind of quiet after that. <laughs> I would describe the Lutheran Church and other mainline Protestant churches with two words, ritualistic and formulaic. Ooh, fancy words. I must have gone to high school or something. Ritualistic. We have an order of worship, and we follow it. In fact, for the sake of brevity, I almost eliminated a few items from the liturgy this morning, but I didn't want anybody to complain, but we didn't get a chance to say the creed. We're formulaic, because if you want to know what we believe, just pick up a copy of Luther's small catechism. Most of us had to memorize it before we could be confirmed. My point is, sometimes you get wrapped up in the structure and in the formula, and you miss the point. Now granted, some of these other churches are run in a loosey-goosey way, but they emphasize having an interaction with God, and then having an interaction with someone else, where you tell them about your interaction with God. God doesn't call us to go out there and quote Luther's small catechism. It's a nice foundation. But the Lord is interested in what you think and what you feel, because God gives us power to be church. I'll close with a story. There was a man named Yates who lived in Oklahoma during the Great Depression of the 1930s. He owned a small ranch there, a couple of hundred acres, you know, what they consider a small ranch down in Oklahoma and Texas. And he struggled as a farmer. Money was tight and food was even tighter. And he wasn't sure how he was going to survive. And then one day, a company representative came to his farm and said, we represent an oil franchise, and based on our surveys, we think there might be oil on your land. We'd like your permission to run a test drill. And so the paperwork was drawn up, the lease was signed, and at 1,115 feet deep, a huge oil deposit was struck. And instantly, Mr. Yates turned into Jed Clapper. <laughs> Black gold, Texas tea. Was the first thing you know, Yates a millionaire. He stayed where he was, and they sank more wells on his land and discovered there was an enormous depository of oil. This guy was sitting on millions of bucks and didn't even know it. He was living as a pauper until he was able to tap into that resource and change his life. We're here on Pentecost Sunday as Americans and as Christians because we have the opportunity to share the love of God with other people. May God bless us as we carry out that task. Amen. We worship God with our own.